Thanks, Simon. Um, and thanks, ladies and gentlemen, once more for uh, joining us this evening on GSC Power Hour. Um, this evening, as you know, we are discussing the benefits of offshore investing. I myself am a manager at Standard Bank Web Trader. Uh, we essentially deal with um, offshore investing. As, as, as Simon did mention, it is actually externalizing currency to uh, an offshore account that's based in either the US or Germany, depending on the currency that you are trading. This presentation, ladies and gentlemen, is really going to be delving into <clears throat> some of the benefits of uh, offshore investing, um, the avenues available to you, as well as lastly touch on a few ETFs that can be used as entry points for your offshore journey. Um, all right, cool. So what exactly is offshore investing? Um, very basically, it's moving money or assets outside one's country of residence. Um, and essentially, you have exposure to offshore ent or you can also have exposure to offshore entities. This can be pursued by way of actually externalizing cash um, or investing in an instrument that is listed on the GSC locally. Usually offshore investing, when we talk about offshore investing, it refers to things like cash, property, equity, unit trusts, ETFs, and bonds to name just a few. So I just want to quickly debunk a couple of myths of offshore investing uh, before we actually proceed to the next slide. Firstly, a lot of people think it is complicated and expensive. That is not true. Um, there are multiple avenues, which I will show you in the next few slides, how you can actually access the offshore market uh, and gain access to um, those markets that, uh, that give you a, a good return and obviously um, account for 99% of, uh, of the world's economy. Another myth is that it's only for the stratospheric, stratospherically wealthy or extremely wealthy. Uh, that's, not in, that's not true either. Uh, people invest offshore to avoid paying tax. Uh, yes, there are some people that invest offshore to avoid paying tax, but obviously our exchange control is pretty stringent, so uh, you have to be really sharp to get around that. <clears throat> and finally, uh, many people think it's associated with physical property in desirable locations, Italian villas, seaside homes, uh, on islands, or even buying islands. It certainly doesn't have to be that complicated. So why <clears throat> do we invest offshore? <clears throat> Three reasons, portfolio diversification. So obviously, if you're diversifying your portfolio, you've all heard the saying, not putting your eggs into one basket. Um, diversification essentially irons out portfolio volatility, as you know, uh, and improves risk-adjusted risk returns. The Nobel Prize economist, um, Harry Markowitz, said it very aptly when he said, diversification is the only free lunch. Also, ladies and gentlemen, um, offshore investing is used as a currency hedge. So if you're looking to, um, if you have a depreciating currency, as we've seen recently with the RAND, um, it acts as a, as a currency hedge if you're externalizing currency or if you're investing in the GSC. If any of you have noticed, if you've invested in one of the local instruments, um, the instrument may not have, have, have increased in value over a specific period of time, but uh, the RAND has weakened and therefore the increase in the overall value of your investment. Another reason why people invest offshore is uh, exposure to global sectors and industries that you would not normally have access to here in SA. The, United, the US market, for example, um, gives you access to the financial, the financial sector and subsectors of that. Um, things like social media, things like blockchain, robotics, um, artificial intelligence is all uh, sectors that you can actually gain access to if you externalize cash. As I've mentioned earlier, the SA capital market just makes up less than 1% of the global economy. So you can, there's, there's a wider market and a, and a wider variety out there for you to access. So why are we not investing offshore? One key word is home bias. So home bias is essentially uh, where an individual investor would most likely invest in his home market because he's familiar with it. Uh, he has an informational advantage. And I think to a certain extent, it also has to do with exchange control, which can, to, which can exacerbate this. So having a look at this fly, slide, you'll see that um, the home bias is indeed uh, something that is, uh, that's persistent and is evident amongst many of local investors. It doesn't just apply to the SA investor, it also applies to an investor in, for example, the United States, where they will also only invest in their home territory. How do we invest offshore? There are a couple of ways to invest offshore. Firstly, you can invest by way of GSC listed instruments, um, shares that are RAND hedges, things like your BHPs, um, your, your SASLs of the world, your um, dual listed as well. 
Those are ways that you can actually gain exposure to offshore markets. Another way that you can actually gain exposure to offshore markets is by trading an ETF that is locally listed. For example, um, your Signias that uh, track offshore markets, your Signia 500, your Signia 4th Industrial Revolution, your Signia FTSEs. Um, not punting Signia, but, uh, but they're a provider that does come to mind. An alternative way that you can actually invest uh, offshore is by way of actually externalizing currency. So that's a method that is being used. We're seeing uh, quite frequently whereby clients of ours actually want to go ahead and move cash, physical cash outside the currency, uh, outside the country rather. Um, and you can do this by way of actually buying foreign currency and remitting it offshore to a, an offshore account. There are many brokers in this country that actually offer the offshore um, service by way of direct investment, and that's in FX. Uh, many of the large banks actually offer that service whereby you can buy shares in Apple or you can buy shares in Samsung or Google, or whatever the case may be. Important to note that if you are trading offshore and you remitting funds offshore, that there are sub exchange control implications, which many people are not aware of. Um, firstly, you need to know that there is a 1 million rand single discretionary allowance, whereby there is no tax clearance certificate required. What that means is that you as a South African individual can transfer up to 1 million rand offshore without the need for a tax clearance certificate. If you want to transfer over and above 1 million, you'd need to get a tax clearance certificate from SARS, and that needs to be a tax clearance certificate for foreign investment allowance purposes. So a couple of considerations, ladies and gentlemen, to, uh, to think about before actually trading or going offshore. Um, firstly, I want to just touch on the investment vehicle that you will be using. If you are investing offshore, directly by way of FX, most broker or brokers rather will only offer you the option to do it in your individual capacity. If you are investing from a, uh, on a, in a local broker or via a local broker, uh, you can still do it via, by way of a trust or by, by way of a juristic entity. So if you are investing overseas by way of externalizing hard currency, you can only do it by way of an indiv by way of an in by, or rather by investing in an individual capacity. And that's purely because of exchange control. Another important consideration to, um, to note is that when you are investing offshore, just take note of the purpose of your investment. If you are going to be using, if you're going to be drawing on the income, it probably isn't very prudent to externalize cash due to the time frame it takes for that cash to be uh, repatriated to SA. Um, so it probably would be a good idea to rather invest in a RAND hedge and then um, as opposed to actually externalizing currency. You also need to take into consideration the fact that your assets will be denominated in either US dollars or ZAR. Are you comfortable with your assets being denominated in USD? Tax, as I've mentioned earlier, if you're going to be investing offshore, uh, there are tax clearance certificates that you would require. Um, the 1 million rand does not require a tax clearance certificate. Obviously, if you're transferring 10 million rand or more, you would require a tax clearance certificate. Estate taxes is another important consideration when you are going offshore. There are some countries that also levy their own estate tax. For example, if you are trading in the United States, um, they have an estate tax that they call CITES that um, essentially taxes you at 40% for a portfolio of over 60,000 US dollars. Um, so if you have a portfolio of over $60,000, um, you should be, uh, should be cognizant of the fact that you would be liable for CITES. In addition to CITES tax, um, there are other taxes that you may be liable. Uh, what you should do prior to actually investing offshore, but and if you can, and if you really can, uh, rather, uh, if you if you worried about taxes, best consult with a tax expert prior to uh, sending money offshore. Um, and then finally, your choice of instrument: uh, Are you comfortable with an internationally listed share? Uh, would you like to invest in an internationally listed share directly? The only way you can actually do that is by externalizing cash. All right, exchange trade funds. So this is the, the second part of my presentation um, and uh, pr probably the part that I'm more passionate about, uh, exchange trade fund selection. So ladies and gentlemen, obviously when you are investing offshore, uh, exchange trade funds is an entry point to the offshore market. You can obviously go ahead and invest directly in shares, but exchange trade funds is an entry point. This is by no means advice. Uh, this is just uh, a couple of options that you have available to you, but a couple of uh, a couple of principles that you should keep in mind before you actually go offshore. Firstly, you should know your investment focus. You should have a strategy. You should have an investment objective.
Secondly, you want to make sure that you're keeping your costs low when you are investing in exchange traded funds as it can become pricey. You don't really see the costs that you're paying for an exchange traded fund because everything is built into the product. I usually go for exchange traded funds that have a total expense ratio of less than 0.5%. And you can find this fee if you look at the actual fa the fund fact sheet. Uh, it will tell you the total expense ratio. Total expense ratio is basically the cost of running the fund. Um, and then finally, you want to look for an exchange traded fund or a fund that is high, that's high in liquidity. And uh, uh, usually I go for shares that or other exchange traded funds that have one, over $100 million uh, in assets or basket constituents. So a couple of ETFs or starting points you can look at, and these are very broad-based index ETFs, uh, and they're all dollar-based. So you've got your S&P, SPY, those are share codes at the top, by the way. Um, the share codes are SPY, um, it's the Spider S&P 500, and then the Vanguard S&P 500. Obviously, the Vanguard, I'm sure many of you have heard of that. That's the one that uh, is touted uh, very frequently by Warren Buffett. Um, they track the S&P 500. It's a very cheap ETF and it's a great way to get exposure, not just to the S&P 500, but also to, uh, it also gives you global exposure. And the reason why I say that is because about 50% of the S&P 500, the companies in the S&P 500, derive their, their earnings globally. Uh, and they both have total expense ratios of less than 0 0.1 or 10 basis points, so extremely cheap in my opinion. The Dow Jones Industrial Average, obviously Dow Jones and the uh, Spider would have some shares that would overlap. Uh, Dow Jones only tracks 30 shares, of course. It's a price-weighted uh, price index. And you've got the QQQ, uh, which is another ETF that tracks the NASDAQ. So if you're looking to get some exposure to the tech-heavy NASDAQ, this is a great entry point for that. And then finally, if you want to get some exposure to the Eurozone, uh, we've got the Eurostox 50 that gives you exposure to the Eurozone economy. It's not doing terrifically at the moment, but then the world isn't doing terrifically at the moment as well. It does give you access to top 50 shares. The share code for that I haven't included is FEZ. Okay, so a couple of broad-based index ETFs, which many of us are, would probably be familiar with, is uh, the Standard Top 40. That obviously gives you exposure to the top 40 um, shares on the JSC. The other one there would be the ETF World, MSCI World Index. I actually hold that particular share. Uh, it gives you access to about, say, 50 or 60% is exposed to the U.S., and the rest of that is to other companies or other countries including Japan and uh, the UK, basically the, the major economies in the world with a small exposure to emerging markets. And then Signia Japan gives you access to the Japanese market. All right, so sector, industry, and specific ETFs. Now, these ETFs are available if you trade offshore. Um, they are dollar-based, so if you, you can actually get exposure to a particular sector um, not just the US, but also globally. If you purchase these ETFs, I just want to quickly run through what they what they const, uh, what their constituents are, or uh, some of the um, some of the attributes of these ETFs. We've got the consumer discretionary ETFs. Basically, the consumer discretionary ETF uh, comprises of shares that are non-essential but desirable. They they basically once uh, they're dependent on the state of the economy, so they do very well when the economy is booming, not very well when the economy is in a trough or in a recession. And they usually include uh, brands that, that attract com or companies that track brands like uh, designer clothing, durable goods, entertainment, uh, leisure, cars, usually luxury goods, etc. Consumer staples ETF. So this is those ETFs uh, that track our needs or our essentials. Um, they're always in demand. Um, it is considered def a defensive sector. So if you buy one of these ETFs, it will do well even in a recession because you as a consumer require essentials or basic uh, amenities. Um, they have rich dividend yields. A good example of that a company within that sector would be Procter & Gamble. Energy ETFs, so if you're looking to get exposure to um, companies that produce or supply energy uh, and are also involved in exploration or development uh, of oil and gas reserves, you can have a look at energy ETFs. Just bear in mind that those particular ETFs have a few companies that dominate that, uh, that indice, um, making up up to 50% of that particular indice. So it may be a good idea to actually look at an equal weighted ETF in that particular sector. 
Financial ETFs, um, that obviously gives you exposure to the broader financial sector in the US. Um, these particular shares um, that are included in these ETFs are highly regulated or these companies are highly, highly regulated and that's purely because of the uh, 08 financial crisis. Financial ETFs usually do well when the economy is doing well. They're a great indicator of the health of an economy. Important to note that these financial ETFs are broad ETFs, so they don't, um, the US market has a lot of depth. It doesn't necessarily just include insurance companies or banks. It is the entire financial sector, no matter how niche that particular firm is. Healthcare ETFs also includes biotechnology. It's an inelastic sector. What that means is that we're not price sensitive to it. Uh, everybody needs health no matter what. Um, also a defensive sector. Technology ETFs. Um, technology ETFs goes without saying. It's, it's probably one of the most in-demand ETFs at the moment. Uh, it includes shares that track electro electronic companies, uh, goods and services in IT, software, and they usually trade at absurd PE multiples, and Simon will probably get into a little later, uh, but that's purely because a lot of it, it, these, these are growth companies and, um, and people are willing to pay, pay the prices for these companies. There's obviously more factors to that, uh, but they never, ever trade at decent multiples. Thematic ETFs, ladies and gentlemen, so this is uh, a, a specialist type of sector. They follow a theme and they generally have higher internal costs. There's only one that I could think of in South Africa, and that's the Signia Fourth Industrial Revolution um, ETF, which tracks companies at the forefront of the Fourth Industrial Revolution. But the rest, the, the four ETFs um, at the bottom, the Robo, Hack, ICLN, and the Block, uh, are tracking ETFs that um, are sort of in the news, robotics, automation, um, as you can see, a total expense ratio of 0.95%, so a very expensive exchange trade fund. It's a fee that you do not see. Um, you've got Hack, which is another ETF that tracks cybersecurity companies. Cybersecurity has been in the news over the last few years uh, with ransomware and ransoms, um, people or other um, criminals demanding ransoms from, uh, from individuals. They also re re derive much of their revenue from system software, of course. Um, ICLN is essentially companies that produce clean energy like solar, wind, and other renewable e uh, sources. So uh, that's another ETF that tracks that particular sector. And then finally, BLOK or Block. Um, it tracks companies that develop and utilize blockchain technology. Um, one of the, key, uh, one of the key, key shares in that particular ETF is Microsoft. That's pretty much our details. Uh, you can give us a call, drop us an email, uh, or follow us on Twitter. Uh, Simon, thank you very much.